Um, as a career educator myself, the challenges that circle around education, as we heard, are never lacking. Um, but then innovation is always possible when that's the case. So there's nothing more important to digital inclusion to change the trajectory of well-being, um, access to life-changing opportunities, and impact on individuals and society than, than is education. Uh, approaches are vast and arguably some of the choices um, have more positive impact than others. And the panelists I'm going to introduce you to have some informed experience about educational choices we make along the way in, in 50 projects and in uh, the world at large uh, that have, um, prom you know, that promote digital inclusion and some that haven't worked, right? That is just as informative. Um, experiences with, with certain strategies might even unintentionally drive uh, a further division uh, in the digital divide. But we're going to dive in and think about education and what is making a difference for real digital inclusion. And so it's my honor to introduce Soraya Fuladi. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of JARA. Um, she's on a mission to ensure that 80, 800 million children in high poverty and low connectivity communities globally can get access to quality education anywhere, anytime through the JARA unit. And so Soraya came up with the idea for JARA as a teenager uh, at the United Nations International School. She went to university to study electrical engineering to learn how to build what is now the JARA unit. She became a teacher and then a business management consultant, helping uh, 72 businesses and products and services from deep tech, and has been building the JARA unit for the past six years with a global team. Um, it's an award-winning initiative, ensuring all children, especially those in off-grid communities, can get quality education, um, particularly for children in low electricity and low internet communities globally. So welcome, Soraya. And thank then you. also, yes, thank you. Thank you for being here. And also we have Amos Fodchuk. He is an 11-year veteran of the classroom. Amos has earned over 20 local, state, and national awards for excellence and in innovation in public education. Among many of his distinctions, he's a national board certified teacher, Fulbright scholar to the People's Republic of China. He's the author of Personalized Learning Through Voice and Choice, published by Solution Tree. He's the president and founder of Advanced Learning Partnerships, an educational consulting firm with hundreds of active partnerships across the United States and Canada. So welcome to you both. I'm so thrilled to share this space with you. I feel so honored just being around um, both of your brains and what you bring to this space. Uh, so welcome. Do you mind? I know I did a little introduction of you, but I'd love to hear a little bit from each of you just about um, what is on your mind lately? What did I leave out in your introduction? And um, yeah, just where is your focus right now? And then we'll dive into some questions. Let's start with you, Soraya, if that's okay. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you so much for having us here, Aaron, everyone at N uh, 50 And just wanna say hi and shout out to our teammates who are on this call today too. We wouldn't be anywhere without our incredible team at JARA. Um, great, so is now a good time for me to show a few slides to share yes. a little bit more about our work at JARA. Let Fantastic. Me, uh, let me wonderful. go ahead and make you a co-host. I was gonna Thank do you. that, but I got all lost and all of the conversation was so good. Amazing. So let's do that right now. Thank you. Actually, Angie, I might need you to help me with that. You could make Soraya a co-host. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, great. And there you go. Can everyone see this? Yep, looks great. Wonderful. So welcome to Jara. We are on a mission to close the digital divide globally through our off-grid K-12 education solutions. So currently we're in this huge global education crisis. Um, during the pandemic, over 815 million children lost their education for about two years with ch children in the Philippines only returning to the classroom just two weeks ago. By 2030, um, learning loss will have a huge economic impact. Before the pandemic, it was estimated to be about 129 billion. After the pandemic, the numbers shot up all the way to $17 trillion. 
So we spent a lot of time globally um, doing research, listening to communities in, you know, very high poverty, post-disaster, or even refugee camps globally. And when we were doing our research in post-disaster Nepal, in Gorkha, um, which was the epicenter of the earthquake, we met an incredible young student named Sanjana. Unfortunately, she lost her school in the 2015 earthquake, and she was put in what is known as a temporary learning center. So these are kind of these, like, not well-built sheet metal structures that are only supposed to be there as a replacement for the classroom for only three weeks until classrooms are supposed to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, you know, disaster relief isn't designed to rebuild infrastructure in the community. It's designed to ensure as many people stay alive right when a disaster is hitting. So the, you know, so uh, there's lots, there's a lot to be desired in terms of infrastructure rebuilding. So in the past 30 years, over 300 regions that have been hit by natural disaster have not had infrastructure rebuilt. And this number will climb with the increase of climate disasters. So this temporary learning center is still the main school that these children use all these years later today. Um, she only gets access to about one teacher for 25% of the day because there's only two teachers for the whole school. So she spends most of the day doing self-study, but unfortunately she's redoing workbooks and textbooks she's already completed because of lack of access to resources. Um, she's still in that same situation today, but during the pandemic she didn't, she didn't even have access to distance learning um, alongside about um, seven over 77% of children in Nepal is only 23% of children in Nepal had access to distance learning. And that number is not unique to Nepal and the situation is not unique to Nepal. Um, one of the main issues is, you know, these communities are very, you know, low connectivity and mostly off-grid communities. So while amazing initiatives like tablets, smartphones, and laptops may work well as distance learning solutions in more on-grid communities or more connected communities, they don't really work in these off-grid communities. Um, so we spent many years spending time alongside communities globally, putting our ears to the ground, co-creating the correct solution alongside these communities that fit exactly what they need. So please meet the JAR unit. This is our off-grid charging e-learning device that could teach any e-learning content in any language, anytime, anywhere. It charges fully off-grid, as you'll see, with crank power on the side and solar cells on the back. We've designed this to be incredibly durable, so this can last an extremely long time and also be able to last really hard terrains through, you know, a refugee um, going to their new host country, all, for example, all the way to someone in a very you know, um, turbulent place in a post-disaster zone. Um, and we've designed an IoT system to do updates and pull data without even needing access to internet too. So this is updatable too. And we have local programming on the ground for this too. So this is what we're currently building. Um, we're heavily research backed too, um, thanks to six years of Stanford research on how effective is teaching through off-grid charging e-learning devices that are in tablets, smartphones, and laptops. Um, and all of our e-learning content, we are focused on K to 12, uh, specifically uh, with the first goal of theory of change to ensure children can pass national exams because in many countries if children fail national exams they get kicked out of the school system. We also all know that you know your traditional k-12 curriculum in your communities may not be everything you need to break your cycles of poverty to make your dreams come true. So we also incorporate life skills curriculum, health curriculum, and so much more. And this is all through amazing e-learning partners all around the world. So that's a little bit about us at JARA. Thank you so much for having us here today. And we're looking forward to answering your questions. Thank and you so much. Out. Thank you. It, Thank that you was all. a great overview. And, and I was really, I was kind of sketching out a, a diagram, which is a skill I learned really well from Amos, actually. He is the whiteboard um, sketch it out guru who has advised me many times, but I was thinking about what you were talking about when we think about education, oftentimes that there is an intersection between devices, pedagogy, yeah. curriculum, and people. Yes. And um, and thinking about your your book, Amos, and personalized learning, I really am struck about how do we not perpetuate, and a lot of these themes have come up earlier in, in our sessions, but how do we not perpetuate um, practices that uh, we know aren't the best or don't work yeah. as well for meeting the needs of students. And so Amos, I'd like to kick it over to you to do a little more of your introduction. Um, tell us what you're thinking about right now. Aaron, I appreciate the credit, although I feel as like I'm a dinosaur in a new world. There's a whole <laughs> phenomenon of sketch noting out there where actual <laughs> talented illustrators and critical listeners 
can synthesize complex ideas visually in real time. And so whatever, whatever scrawlings I, uh, I, I subjected <laughs> you to on whiteboards, I appreciate there's a whole new generation that has redefined the genre. Uh, Soraya, it is wonderful to meet you. I, I wonder if my path ever would have crossed with yours were it not for the N50 Forum and Geeks Without Frontiers. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a joy to learn more about your story and your organization's commitment to service. Um, that's really cool. And I'm looking forward to learning from you and Aaron and, um, and the entire uh, collaborative here this afternoon. Um, I, I'll share a few slides as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting into dialogue, so I'll keep this simple. Anyone who wants to follow on your respective screen can access um, these slides. Awesome. Angie, we may need a little help with uh, Amos as co-host as well. Thank you, Ange. Um, so, well, and here we go. It does not take Angie long. Um, She's very fast. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think, Erin, the, the bio is, is just fine in terms of who I am. I, I, would, I would prefer to share just a little bit more about who we are as an organization. Um, Be wonderful. So I will very quickly provide an overview of what Advanced Learning Partnerships is and how we go about our work. I, um, whoops. Let's see, can everyone see okay? Yep, looks great. Lovely, okay. So um, Advanced Learning Partnerships is in its uh, 13th year of existence. Uh, I started the organization um, in partnership with my wife, Dr. Katie Fodcha, uh, and together we had a, a vision for service that went above and beyond um, the current limitations of education in the United States and Canada. Uh, we wanted to contribute to something bigger than ourselves. And, and over the course of the last 13 years, we've grown as an organization to include um, colleagues who live in 22 states and six provinces across North America. Um, we were well positioned for the, the destabilizing aspects of the pandemic in that we've never had a brick and mortar um, office. We've always existed in in this very kind of new age space um, of virtual collaboration, um, swarm teaming, and really focused on service to the communities that welcome us into their work over multiple years. And so um, Advanced Learning Partnerships is a consultancy. Uh, we, we have 27 unique services really designed to help organizations of every size, every geographical location, to build the local capacity that enables uh, learner-centered models to um, start, grow, and ultimately thrive. And so um, we've, we've been honored to uh, serve hundreds of communities over the years. And at this point, we're working at any given point in time with somewhere in the vicinity of 500 to 600 school systems of, of virtually every size and location across uh, North America. And so as, as I was listening to the conversation before ours, um, I, I, I heard some really important and urgent um, uh, kind of commitments to understanding what we're going after at scale. If we, don't, if we don't define our terminology, very quickly we find ourselves limited and siloed by interpretations of, of nouns and verbs. And so I, I pulled a couple different case studies that, that I just want to walk through very quickly that show how um, inclusion and commitment to local uh, co local nuances in community are actually the force multipliers that contribute to scale. And the top-down mandates in education very rarely, um, very rarely produce scalable results uh, because we're not taking into consideration the nuances and the important strengths that communities have and can bring to the table when it comes to crafting authentic and scalable and sustained solutions. Um, so I wanna start in Virginia and then we'll, we'll move to North America. Um, over the course of the last four years, Advanced Learning Partnerships has, has worked very closely with the Virginia Department of Education 
um, and a number of other Virginia nonprofits uh, to scale an initiative called uh, the Virginia Leads Innovation Network or Valen. Uh, the outcomes are focused on, on, on ensuring that deeper learning outcomes are accessible to every learner through active student engagement. And so that terminology sounds buzzwordy, um, but we've worked very carefully with the department and our partners to very carefully define what that looks like operationally. So a critical lesson that we've learned and that we apply in all of our partnerships is prior to operationalizing around anything at scale, it's really important that your partners um, and your stakeholders have a common understanding of what, what the language is, what the key terminology is, and what it means to them. Very frequently we find that uh, initiatives do a great job of communicating what the language is relative to the initiative, but the work in translating what that means for parents, what that means for students, what that means for teachers and, and school district administrators often gets left um, unattended. It's especially important when you're thinking about um, the proximity of communities relative to cities. And so the, the difference in access between rural, between urban, between suburban is, is important and that those, those differences were exacerbated through the pandemic. Um, and in some ways, um, we saw the growth of, of Valen just through the fact that, that this is a four year initiative and that we started with one cohort that grew into a second, a third, and three weeks ago, we just launched our fourth cohort. Um, the scale of impact of a, of a network is key. So within the span of a state that serves over 1.3 million students through public education, um, through this very careful alliance building, we've, a, we've been able to reach 80% of the school divisions across the Commonwealth of Virginia, serving well over 850,000 of those students. By no means are we, are we done. Um, and we don't aspire to, to claim that we've solved for anything yet. The, the critical element here of the Valen network, from my point of view, boils down to a few truths. Um, if, we're, if we're going to use the term inclusion, um, and if we're going to apply a standard of excellence um, that, that meets the challenge of, of being inclusive for children, we have to practice that with adults, understanding that teachers are gatekeepers and that schools are either accelerators or restrictors to innovation is a key design concept that we need to keep in mind when we're planning our implementations. Um, ensuring that educators are able to meet with one another is a critical non-negotiable. Um, teaching can be one of the loneliest professions if you if you never feel like you can leave the, the classroom. Likewise school, likewise district. And so ensuring that um, the permission to innovate within a network is reinforced, that, that, that forces um, uh, inertia um, to be acknowledged and to be challenged. Um, this is a coaching-based uh, initiative and so we have a team of very talented educational coaches who are engaging over the course of multiple years the leadership capacity development of hundreds and hundreds of superintendents, principals, lead teachers, and district administrators. By building that local leadership capacity, we are in a position to support uh, sustainable growth in the communities that will mobilize around this common language that we make an investment in. Um, I, I noticed that Kim and Dell Technologies and Intel were represented in the last um, session. And so I just very briefly want to highlight a second case study here, um, Girls Who Game, uh, which is a continental and now global commitment to welcoming girls into the, the onboarding portal to STEM careers. Um, I, I'm just sharing some, some statistics here that will surprise no one. Um, the economy is radically transforming opportunities for an employment and purposeful um, connection to community are, are vibrant in this vertical. 
And yet we're underutilizing our human resources by not activating the talent of women who are girls at one point in time. And so um, it, it really is important to find opportunities in communities that might not have natural partnerships with business partners, with local universities, and provide accessible opportunities to understand and to set a vision for what could be in girls as young as fourth grade and really thinking through this, this triangulation of um, play and visioning and mentorship. An important component of Girls Who Game isn't just that coaches work with teachers that work with girls, it's that professionals in the technology space, in the STEM careers, um, have access to mentorship with these girls and doing all of this through um, the, uh, the, the sustainable development goals creates a common language that isn't just continental, but that's global. And so um, over the course of the last almost three years, Girls Who Game um, launched about six months before the pandemic, and it scaled in the exact moment that the world went from normal to remote. And so it, it is a true testament to the partnership uh, that Dell Intel, and I even believe that Geeks Without Frontiers has had uh, a contribution to helping to scale this. Um, ALP has contributed through ongoing coaching um, to the teachers who lead close to 300 clubs that serve over 3,000 girls in four countries, three languages, and, and we're really just beginning our, our, uh, our commitment to scaling this. Um, Dell Technologies and their um, ESG um, um, partner have been instrumental in working with Microsoft, Intel, and other partners in creating the opportunity for girls, teachers, and schools um, to contribute to this, this process in a way that isn't just um, strategic and powerful, but also a lot of fun. So. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, and bringing up this sense and the challenge around scale. Um, and Soraya, I, I feel like you and I had a conversation a while back, and this is not in our pre-planned questions. So I hope you all are, are okay with just kind of going with some of these concepts that are coming up. But this idea of scaling a network that you beautifully illustrated, Amos, with your, your maps, but thinking about a network um, in terms of people power, right? And the challenges around doing that, but thinking through the the scalable opportunities of building a network. And Sarai, you talked about, I think they were called JARA ambassadors. Am I remembering Correct. that right? Yes. But I, yeah, and, and then you. thinking about the coaching models, Amos, is, um, and, and JARA, could you share with us your thought process around the sustainability of a, of, of a model of, providing true transformative connectivity um, through your network of people? And, and what was the thinking behind that as a potential solution? Did my question make sense? Yeah, do you want to start, Amos? <laughs> no, go well, ahead, try it. Feel free. Okay. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so just to share a little bit more about our JAR ambassador program, is yeah, that like yeah, how did you how did you decide that that was a an important component of sustainability for the of project? course? Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Aaron. So um, at JARA, our JARA ambassador program is a program where we hire local community members within the communities that we serve who are in charge of the JARA program. So they're in charge of doing distribution, maintenance, teacher and student support updates um, and, uh, you know, serviceability of the JAR program and also coaching of the students and teachers through this. Um, there are quite a few reasons why we were, why we decided this is one of the most core and most important parts of what we're building is because um, when you're working and supporting and building with um, very vulnerable communities, it's so important that the initiative is local facing and it's created, it's created by the local communities um, because they deserve that agency, they deserve that empowerment to be able to, you know, 
working on solving the uh, problems in their communities um, as local community members and especially for distribution um, it's you know within the humanitarian space any physical object handed to a vulnerable person that's known as a handout it's so important that that is done in an empowered way mm -hmm. and one of those empowering ways to do it is through local community members handing out the handouts to other local community members mm -hmm. um, instead of a foreigner coming in because imagine if you know we're all just sitting here and a stranger just storms through the door and drops off a wheelbarrow of bricks and hands you one, takes a picture and it's like, I'm this is going to save your life and leaves. <laughs> your chance of adopting that brick is near zero. And also you feel kind of offended too. You're yeah. like, I was just enjoying my day in the cafe or whatever. And then suddenly this happened. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we really want to make sure it's an empowered um, process, but also a sustainable system with the JAR ambassadors. They do updates and pull data from the JAR units back to us and back and forth. Um, every three days and that's how we're able to do our measurement evaluation system um, support the students and teachers as best as possible because this is a teaching tool for teachers and a learning tool for students and also this is an ed tech solution and um, you know some of the failings in past ed tech solutions is that um, the onus is put on the teachers to run the whole program and implement it and learn and just be in charge of the ed tech on top of their education that and running the classroom and more that's too much for a teacher their jobs are extremely hard and we need to have other people supporting the ed tech side of this so we also have the jar ambassadors just support to run the actual jara program to supplement the teacher and the students so um yeah that's that's some of the core um, reasonings behind this and that increases sustainability because now, you know, the students have a coach, someone checking in, supporting their use of this every three days and same with the teachers too. So that's a little bit behind the JAR Ambassador Program. Thanks for that. And and Amos, I, I'm hearing so many connections between some of the struggles around the, the technical implication and the coaching and pedagogy side and how those two things come together. Um, maybe this is an opportunity to talk about some of those challenges. It looks like Michael's asking for some insight into the challenges that you see. Um, as well, coming from that coaching perspective, yeah, in particular. And, and Soraya, I um, it, everything that you shared around the intersection of ed tech and and humanism is really where the rubber meets the road, right? Like finding the right balance of turnkey and and customization and and human voice. But that. That sounds a little aspirational, but when it really gets down to the level of implementation analytics, yeah. if you don't have um, metrics that go beyond just simple usage, then you're going to get lowest common denominator threshold attainment, and you're not going to get you're not going to get to higher levels of proficiency. You're not going to get to autonomy beyond the intervention, and so that's. That's ultimately where we've chosen to specialize is by being technology agnostic, initiative agnostic, agnostic, and and learner learner centered and pedagogy forward, right? And so everyone in our organization brings amazing experience and skill as accomplished teachers and principals, um, superintendents, coaches, school board trustees, and so we bring we bring this really diverse range of experience and skill and, and we team up cons continuously in near infinite configurations based on the evolving needs of communities. And so we're not an, we're, we're not focused on interventions per se. Um, we're really dependent on the local capacity of communities because our goal is not to be an outsource. Our goal is to be a partner in building the human capacity that can exist within, within an organizational infrastructure. And so you know, the profile of our partnerships tends to be multi-year um, because we, we're very intentional about customizing to the strengths that a community has. Um, we're, we're very, we mobilize around an appreciative inquiry lens so that we're, we're focused on, on anchoring the community's early success in strengths that they have, and then finding strategic ways of bridging gaps and working toward future state outcomes through um, the capacity building uh, that can be achieved through um, strategic consulting and coaching. And so, Michael, a lot of the, the challenges that we run into are um, organizations that want to run fast as opposed to 
um, really adopting the discipline of building a, a critical foundation that can then be scaled. Um, we also find that um, a, a lot of folks will, will kind of move forward without examining assumptions and um, acknowledging gaps in, in their human infrastructure and in their organizational structure. And, and so uh, ensuring that those, um, those conversations translate to action within the first three months, the first six months and the first year of a partnership are, are really the, the precursors to success versus um, best intentions um, not realized. And so I'm happy to go into more detail, but that, that really is where I feel like, Aaron, you, you and the Geeks Without Frontiers team did a beautiful job of finding um, someone who leads a human infrastructure uh, organization and Soraya, who, who is really focused on, on like moonshot solutions through the purposeful application of technology tools that, that will exist in real environments that, that can authentically answer the question of inclusion. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. Thank that, you. Well, well stated, Amos. And, and that really brings me to um, this question about emerging trends that you both see from your, your two different lenses, right? Uh, what is something in 2022 that we just can't ignore when it comes to digital inclusion in the education space? And to kind of preface that a little bit, um, yesterday we had a, a speaker who had a hunch that uh, mobile technology for teachers is the direction that that we're headed, particularly in uh, rural Africa, right? That that he really, you know, was thinking that that's the most sustainable way is to have a, a, a mobile phone in the hand of a teacher um, versus trying to go one-to-one -one for all students, increasing the need for power um, and solar. When And so it was interesting, right, to, to hear people consider, you know, this is a hunch that I'm seeing by living uh, in, in community and observing the lived experiences of the people that I'm with in the communities. So what are some hunches that you have uh, th that may or may not be connected to that example, that when it comes to digital inclusion, we just, we can't ignore right now. What, what kind of comes to mind for you? Yeah, so wonderful. Right, let's start with you. Thank you so much, Erin, for that question. I think it's extremely important. Um, so for us, um, our biggest, um, you know, what data even proves right now too, is we have to meet communities where they are today and support these students in these communities today where they are. We love the idea of the world being connected. We love the idea of increasing connectivity everywhere. That's great. And also the timeline of when we'll actually reach global connectivity, connectivity could look like 15 years, 20 years, or even more, right? That's a whole generation just lost if we don't try to intervene to support these communities um, with their access to e-learning anytime, anywhere, because the consequence, look at that, about 800 million children just fully out of school for two years, right? That's, we cannot do that ever again. That is not okay. Um, and the loss of learning and the consequences of that are humongous. And these are so many lives getting affected. And, you know, there is an increase of climate disasters going on. There are increases of things like pandemics and more. We need to meet communities where they are today, which is supporting people in off-grid communities, supporting people in low internet communities, you know, co-creating the correct solutions that they actually need anytime, anywhere. And also just the urgency of this timeline too goes into one of the most, one of the top solutions for climate drawdown. So um, the number three most effective climate drawdown solution actually is educating a girl. And this is something that's not advertised. This is not spoken about often. It's it's really upsetting that this isn't the number one thing. People are like, let's do something about this because right now um, we have, it's about, I think about 7.2, uh, 7.3 billion people on the planet. Um, if we don't get this current generation of girls, mostly in high poverty, off-grid and low connectivity communities, access to the quality education they need, um, we will end up with about 9.7 billion people on the planet by 2050. And that's not supposed to happen. But the reason that happens is because of lack of rights-based family planning. A lot of young girls, when 
they don't have access to education. They are forced into having kids very young as teenagers or even younger. And they have often, as a consequence, seven kids minimum, right? Um, and girls who do have access to quality education, these communities have on average three because they do have access to rights-based family planning as a consequence of getting access to education. So if we do get this current generation of girls, their access of, to education, especially in these communities, will go from about 7.3 billion people on the planet to maybe 7.5 by 2050, which, which helps us have a chance at solving this climate crisis, versus if we don't do something today, we'll end up with irreversible damage to our people, our earth, and it will be really hard to um, solve this climate crisis. So it's really urgent that we meet communities where they are today. Wow. Thank you for making that. That You're reminding me of uh, an, an, this conversation throughout the day of and this tie of education and the implications that are huge. And starting off, I think it was, maybe, maybe it was yesterday when we were talking through the disaster and resilience session about the key to uh, conservation of the earth and climate change is education. And yes. so making those ties and seeing that this is all... Um, an ecosystem uh, is really, really important. And I appreciate you bringing that uh, to our attention. Thank you. Amos, what is, what is brewing in your mind about what are some of the hunches when it comes to digital ed inclusion in education um, that, that have your mind twirling right now? Thanks, Aaron. I, I would just, I would second everything that Soraya shared around um, the glo glo global commitment to creating true equity of access for ongoing learning experiences for children with an emphasis on girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's as important as anything that, that I'll share that complements what, what Soraya, you've shared. Um, I, I do think um, that within education, but also beyond education, that there are some global trends that are are deeply alarming and are going to have deep implications uh, that, that are already evident, that are only going to be exacerbated. Um, the profusion of technology has been incredible and the, the positive examples of that are, are legion. Um, what we spend less time talking about and previewing the data that is becoming increasingly robust and, and conclusive is that human beings are, are not thriving in the midst of uh, this unrelenting technolo technological um, kind of revolution. And communities and humans are, are not evolving at the same rate of innovation that our technology systems are. And we're seeing that in um, the, the reduction of middle-class um, uh, cost of living allowances for families in in all in all countries, we're also seeing a, a tremendous um, assault on on the health of, of human beings as a result of uh, exposure to technology with a, with an emphasis on social media and and really just spending too much time engaged in 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 the application of technology and and so this idea of wellness within education. Uh, begins, but it, it, it spiders very quickly outside of the school. And finding the common language is easy. The research is already out there um, for, for children, for families, for teachers, um, for, for community members. Um, this definition of wellness is an absolute urgency to understand and to develop literacy locally um, so that folks have a common language that helps them understand that have, doing yoga is not going to change your mental health and your wellness if this system around you is causing a scaled hardship that you can't resolve. And so we're taking an organizational and a systems lens to understanding how humans exist in systems and how the system must evolve in order for the outputs um, produced by humans to become more purposeful. And so we, we have on our team a number of data scientists, a number of organizational psychologists who are, who are innovating and creating systems level um, resources 
coaching, support, and consulting uh, that will help organizations evolve to create more purposeful blends of technology infusion and um, connection to the community, connection to the physical world, connection to nature, um, and connection to self. And so I'll, I'll pause there because there's a lot that goes into that. But that's really all I'm thinking about is how can we create a more humane experience in learning um, and, and not putting so much en emphasis and onus on the individual setting the goals. Mm -hmm. It has to be the organization that creates the readiness conditions for humans to thrive. And right now we're putting way too much pressure on teachers, on principals, on families, and on kids. Ooh. That is, um, that is a lot. <laughs> That's a lot to unpack. There is a lot in what you said. Um, so much resonates with me personally thinking about um, the, the concept of psychological wellness um, as being, it, it, at least in my research and looking at psychological wellness consisting of a sense of autonomy, a sense of competence, and a sense of relatedness with with community and when any of those pieces are missing there's an imbalance in place and so in the lens of of education um, and thinking about girls right and having a level of autonomy or agency to make decisions and to endorse those decisions it's huge it's huge and then that while that is individualistic it is uh, a system it's part of a bigger system um, looks like we have a question. So partnership has been a thread running through this and in all of other previous sessions. What types of partners do you have and or do you need to get to scale, to take some of these ideas, crucial ideas, and move to scale? What's coming up for you? Great. Yeah, I can start. Well, firstly, thank you so much for that question, David. Um, yeah, so for us, partnerships is the name of the game. It's not one initiative that'll solve the global education crisis and solve this digital divide. It is many, many different initiatives coming together to make it happen, hence why the N50 project is just so incredible and we're so honored to be part of N50 project. So firstly, the N50 project is one of our proud partners that we're very grateful to be part of. Um, beyond that, corporate partnerships um, have been one of the most important part types of partnerships for us. Um, who have been able to give us you know, access to resources and the systems we need to be able to take this from where we are to launch, to scale and more. Some of the partnerships that we really do need now more than ever are funding partnerships, those who can help us get the resources, the funding we need to take this from where we are today to where we need to go. Um, you know, it's just the truth that um, you know, um, women-led initiatives and women of color-led initiatives get less than 2% of funding which is just ridiculous, right? Um, women of color led initiatives, we get less 0.2% of uh, funding too. So it's just so important that we get access and we get the support from the people here who could help us introduce us to the right people, who can be our advocates. So we can get this incredible initiative from where we are today to where we need to go to help hundreds of millions of children globally. Great point. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the P in ALP is partnerships, and, and we are nothing uh, without our, our partners, and we have a history of partnering with organizations over a long period of time, as I mentioned earlier. One of our longest running and, and most strategic and valued partners is Dell Technologies. We, we've worked together very closely for uh, 12 years, and that relationship has been um, deeply rewarding and complimentary in that Dell Technologies brings this amazing network of, of educational communities and relies on advanced learning partnerships to execute on the, on the pedagogy, the intersection of, of pedagogy and curriculum and assessment, and in some cases, but not nearly all, technology. And so we've, we've really enjoyed and work hard and are, are deeply grateful for that. Uh, partnership. Um, we also work with a number of nonprofits and governmental agencies around the implementation of scaled initiatives. And so uh, Advanced Learning Partnerships is a very specialized entity that focuses on implementation and execution. And so um, our, the partner profile that we find works best with us 
are organizations that are brokers, um, that, that have access to rich and vibrant communities, um, that, that have the established trust to welcome us in at a strategic level. Um, we also find that organizations that have a clearly defined vision and mission and common language framework are easiest to work with at scale because they know what they want, what they're going after in terms of outcomes. And because we customize um, our supports to, to measurable um, outcomes, it makes us very easy for us to operationalize around uh, a vision that is, uh, that is aligned with our own values. And so um, we, we tend to have a very small number of dedicated uh, partners that are complementary to our, our, our implementation capacity. And uh, that's, that, that is exactly why um, we're very grateful to, to be part of, of this collaborative because it takes um, what we do within the United States and Canada and force multiplies it across the globe. Thank you for that, Amos. And you, you're really making me think about um, a conversation this morning about digital literacy and being connected to a common language. Um, our speaker, Dr. King, was saying um, digital literacy to her had an implication of being digitally illiterate. And, illiterate and is there a better term to use and and some different things were kicked around around digital empowerment and um getting laser like focused on what those outcomes are so as, as you know in 50 projects they they are designed to ultimately solve connectivity challenges but through meaningful adoption um, and they're often initiated around a community need that is around a particular area. It might be telehealth focused. It might be um, focused on agriculture, as, as Kevin mentioned in our previous session. What educational connections do you make across sectors that we might learn from? Are there some universal principles? And I think you've mentioned some throughout the course of our conversation, but are there some universal principles from education that transcend across digital inclusion initiatives that we could draw from regardless of the project's um, origin? That's a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the biggest core ones is listening right? That's huge in education. Um, but it's even, it's equally as important when we start figuring out digital inclusion is listening to the communities that we're looking to serve um, and support and create with, right? Because sometimes you may meet a community, they actually don't want to become digitized. And that is okay, right? It's okay that they might not want internet access if they are a local tribe indigenous to a community, and they have their own amazing systems that are incredible, you know, centuries old knowledge that is beyond what is taught in schools and what is, you know, on the internet, that is 100% okay. And that's just part of the culture. And we need to respect the community's wants and needs instead of um, imposing what we think a community wants. That's, that's, I think that's the way that um, harm could be done through um, good intentions is if we don't listen to communities and ask questions. So that's the biggest thing is listen to communities, ask questions, and really respect um, the wants and needs of communities. Thank you. So I, I would, I would uh, reciprocate, and I, I would add one additional layer of detail from, from our point of view. And Michael, your question around implementation challenges, and David, your question around partnership, I think kind of converge here. Um, so in the work that we've done for over a decade, we've gotten very good at, um, at solving for scale technology solutions inside communities through pedagogy, through assessment, through curriculum. Um, and we're learning all the time. It's not like we can't do it better. We're always learning. Um, but if I'm gonna be as honest as I can be, the degree to which we're successful in a school system is directly related to the health of the community that hosts that, that public education mm -hmm. organization. And where I want to finish my career and what I'm, what I'm mobilizing my organization and, and supporting my team to realize is 
where where are the ALPs in local and civic governmental engagement in healthcare reform in in community based policing like we need to we need to de determine and we need to understand collectively what are the critical pillars of a community's strength and understand not just how we're creating innovation and success in silos but really creating a seamless um, community collective impact model that will directly benefit local communities. Um, we won't get we won't get to any scaled um, degree of transformative health at the community level unless we're acknowledging the, the strengths and the unique interrelations that the pillars of, of a community have. Mm -hmm. And and so that that is very difficult to scale, but I don't think there's a turnkey solution. I don't think there's anything that's going to radically transform all of those pillars through one entry point. And so that's the messy work, and that's really what we're already establishing a foundation for solving. And, and if there's an ask that I have in this community, it, it, it's this. How do we do that together? Mm. Mm -hmm. That is the question. <laughs> you know, I was I was reviewing my notes, and one of the things you said, Amos, early on about uh, it's almost a principle of inclusion for kids begins with inclusion for adults. And I think that transcends also into systems, that the health of health systems and the health of an education system are are definitely connected. Um, oh, we have a we have another question from Michael. Um, would you share one or two things you've learned about the importance of empowering the communities, your program support in ways that respect how they are socialized? Great. Thank you so much, Michael, for this question. Um, that really resonates to, you know, our core values and how we work at JARA. Um, so, you know, it's so true that all around the world, we are all socialized differently and we all have different cultures and that's what makes this a beautiful world. And um, for us at Jara, we that is one of our priorities to respect and support and ensure we, you know, maintain cultural empowerment through our programs, uh, supporting the communities that we build and work alongside. Um, so um, the most important thing we really learned is let's make sure that we're supporting that. So the way we do that is um, within each country, we have country directors who are people from those countries born and raised who have been building and co-creating amazing solutions for their whole careers in their communities. Um, so those are the country directors. Under those are the JARA ambassadors who are the local community members. Then there's the local teachers, the local students, you know, working with the families and more. And we let each, you know, each community, each country program be in charge of what are the cultural interactions, what are the traditions, what is this, you know, they have full agency over whatever that, is, whatever they want to do and need to do that's culturally relevant and supports their system for socialization and more so that um, the program can be as impactful as possible. So, you know, the program does look different a little bit everywhere in the world because we do make sure it's co-created in the right way that um, it maintains cultural um, dignity. Dang. Thank you. We have to talk, Sarai. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, Michael, my, my response to your question, especially in, in the education kind of vertical, is that so many of the metrics that exist across communities are evaluative and they're trailing indicators. So, you know, we're, we're continuously measuring the past and somehow making illogical decisions on how we're going to prepare for the future. Um, it's an imperfect model. It's, it, it is colonially, colonialist and, and ham-fisted. And it, it's, we're good at it because we've been doing it for 100 years. And so the way that we acknowledge a community's vibrancy, a community's strengths, and its uniqueness is by working with the school system to build some leading indicators some some data points that are unorthodox that are more human centered that are formative as opposed to evaluative and that are designed to offer um, predictable uh, validity around the degree to which what we're measuring now will have implications on the future and by taking our time remember what i said earlier about 
really building a strong foundation in the first three months, the first six months, the first 12 months, it's, it's asking ourselves, what are we measuring? Um, to what degree is it a, a, a snapshot of the past? And what could we measure that, that is equally relevant and that is more native to our, to our local community that will resonate and will create a sense of voice and co-authorship among our stakeholders that we can then build capacity through a multiple year implementation. Um, so it sounds like a very statistics heavy um, element. It's not, it's more focused around community meetings, um, go, not just having meetings in schools because a lot of our stakeholders whose voices aren't always uplifted in education don't have positive relationships with schools and don't have the time or the, the trust um, to, to go to schools because they're not sure if their voice will be heard. Um, so having meetings in churches and local community um, uh, cultural centers, going on onto workplaces and having real dialogues with people um, who are tied to public education and are counting on public education to help their children um, achieve more and achieve at higher degrees of, of choice in the way that they, they lead their lives as adults is a really important initial stage that informs everything that we do together in the future. So I hear I hear so much. I'm the the theme of co-creation, co-authorship. It really is um, something that and and this idea of metrics. It's it's almost like you knew what the next session was. We were we're moving into impact and measurement and and really kind of examining those systems. And so this is a beautiful kind of transition into that. We. We're so thankful, as, as David says in the chat, we're definitely just thankful and grateful for your both of your time today. Um, really uh, want to continue this conversation with our partners and continue to inform um, our N50 projects to bring this spirit. I think it's at the, at the center of our, our framework for N50 projects is to uh, have that co-creation and engaging with communities where they are, um, what is important to them. Thank you, Michael, for that question, because it is it is truly um, one that should drive everything. Um, we have one minute left. I see Kevin is doing the pop into the screen <laughs> bit that is normally my role, um, but I appreciate that, Kevin. Um, can't thank you enough. Uh, as as we're departing, if either of you have any final words to say, um, and just please accept our greatest uh, sincere thanks for being here. Thank you all so much for having us. It is such an honor for us at Chara to be co-creating with the N50 project. And you know, if there's one thing you think about today is what am I doing to ensure that educating a girl is one of my priorities in the way I create impact in the world. So mm. thank you all. Thank you. That's a great query to finish this on. Thanks everyone. <laughs>